Jesus is forever trying to offset, trying to prevent, trying to get rid of the incipient notion that he's a second God. Unfortunately, his success there has been rather limited because of the stupidity of our own misreadings of the scriptures and our emotional bondage when it comes to subscribing to traditions that are obviously post-biblical. I think we have to recognize that whatever group you tend to belong, give your life to, there can occur an emotional bondage to the things you've been taught to believe. Yes, it may be shocking to think that Christianity departed from the faith, but if we go back to the creed of Jesus in Mark 12, it will become apparent that we did depart the creed of Jesus. That's very serious. That interrupts our relationship with God. Try the truth. Try the simple truth that God is one, that Jesus is the Messiah, and above all the Gospel, as the Gospel about the coming Kingdom of God, firstly, and our training now to be prepared to assist in the rulership of that coming Kingdom of God on the earth when Jesus returns. The problem with emotional bondage and attachment to traditional systems is that it's very hard to break that traditional binding to a system that one has been taught from very early years or from beloved Sunday school teachers and so on. The sheer weight of the tradition is overwhelming for people. They then begin to worry about their predecessors who didn't believe some of these easy truths about God being one and that feeds then into the equation and makes it doubly difficult for them to abandon what has been family tradition all these years. I would recommend that people look at Romans chapter 2, 14 to 16 and let God deal with those people who never had the law properly. Let God deal with them in the second resurrection. Let the sliding scale principle of John 15, 22 apply here where Jesus said that the Pharisees became guilty only when he presented the truth to them. He didn't condemn them all out of hand but once they were given this truth then he was very hard on them. So let that sliding scale of judgment apply in every case but it's necessary for us to be helpful, I think, in this generation, to help people to read the Bible, which they're not doing successfully now, by pointing out that Jesus was a unitary monotheist. He believed in one God. That's where it starts. That truth is all changing, life changing on a massive scale. Now, it may get you kicked out of a few Trinitarian settings, but who cares? That's not the point. Go about your way and do your business, gently pointing out that Jesus made the Shema, the Unitarian Creed of Israel, the most important of all the commandments is that God, not a triune God unknown to Jesus, that is supposed to be loved along with the neighbor. But we can make this point. Jesus has a very brutal technique in dealing with his disciples. He warns them that unless one is able to break ties with traditional systems in favor of the teaching of Jesus, one cannot even begin to be a disciple. This is very brutal, very harsh uh, teaching. Certainly everyone has to admit that. But it nevertheless is New Testament Christianity. There was an occasion when Jesus was teaching, as of course he taught hour after hour after hour, when the people came and said, Jesus, your parents want to see you, and they're standing at the door wanting to talk to you. And he immediately, rather rudely, as we might conceive it today, brushes them aside, stretches forth his hand to the disciples who are sitting with him and says, who are really my mother and father, brother and sister? These people are hearing my teachings. Everything is about the teaching of Jesus. That's why 2 John 7 is so important. If anybody comes to you and doesn't bring the sound, health-giving words of Jesus, that's actually 1 Timothy 6.3, but the same principle. If you haven't got the words of Jesus, you don't sound like Jesus. Jesus did not talk about souls going to heaven when they die. He did not talk about entering to, into some disembodied state at death. He never did. He always looked forward to the resurrection in the future and the parousia, the second coming, the single second coming, no pre-tribulation rapture resurrection, that's another mythology, but a post-great tribulation resurrection of the dead, and then a new world when Satan will have been bound. And mentioning the word Satan, an example, I have to say this, of emotional bondage is when some Christadelphians, a group of kingdom believers, insist that the demons do not exist. This is an amazing false attachment to an idea which in other cases they would never entertain. Their treatment of scripture is most reasonable and takes into account the Jewish background extremely well. However, when it comes to demons, they are completely at sea. They've been taught that there cannot be an evil supernatural power. So when you confront them with James 1, where James says, even the demons believe in the one God and tremble, they are reduced to nonsense. All they can say is, well, non-existent beings believe in the one God and tremble. Now, the Christian world is smiling when I say that. 
But if you're a Christadelphian and your beloved Sunday school teacher has taught you on pain of death that you're not to believe in supernatural evil, it is almost impossible for you to change. It's an absolute miracle. The real miracle is when people can get their eyes open and say, my goodness, I've been taught this all these years and it's now fundamentally false. I see it now. And then pick up the pieces and move on. But until we're willing to do that, to change our minds in radically important ways, we don't make much progress with Bible reading and therefore with spirituality.